Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on September 21st of 2022. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. And we're going to do what we frequently do. I know we didn't do one last week. Sorry, Mom. I know you're watching and looking for it. But uh, we were both busy, unavailable, but we're going to go uh, hit it today. Um, we've got some interesting texts for us today. It'll be interesting to see how it blends together, but looking forward to having this conversation with, with you today. So uh, let, let me open it in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, love us enough to give us your word, uh, to give us your son, Jesus Christ, uh, to call us back into a relationship with you each and every day. I pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified by the reading of your word and we as part of the community of faith would be built up in our faith and um, be transformed, continually transformed into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. Starting today with our typical bevy of psalms and ones that uh, we have done frequently, but always good to uh, remember these words and to reflect upon them on an ongoing basis. Uh, I do regularly love how the Psalms are able to hit a variety of human emotions um, and circumstances, situations, and we learn from that that God knows all of the different uh, conditions of the human heart and promises to be present with us through them. So some Psalms are frequently challenging, uh, some are very celebratory, uh, but all of them are, are ultimately reflections of uh, of the human heart and how God is working in and through it uh, to, uh, to for, our, for our benefit. So I'm going to start today with Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of their peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. In Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor is pleasure in the speed of the runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Reading today from Esther chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of records, the annals, and they were read to the king. It was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had conspired to assassinate King Hazarus. Then the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? 
The king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So the king's servants told him, Haman is here, standing in the court. The king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? Haman said to himself, Whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king wishes to honor, let royal robes be brought which the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden, with a royal crown on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let him robe the man whom the king wishes to honor, and let him conduct the man on horseback through the open square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Quickly, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to the Jew Mordecai, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse and robed Mordecai and led him, riding through the open square of the city, proclaiming, Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. When Haman told his wife of Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his advisers and his wife Zeresh said to him, if Mordecai, before whom your downfall has begun, is of the Jewish people, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman off to the banquet that Esther had prepared. In front of Acts, we're going to read chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. He entered the synagogue and for three months spoke out boldly and argued persuasively about the kingdom of God. When some stubbornly refused to believe and spoke evil of the way before the congregation, he left them, taking the disciples with him, and argued daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. And from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. And Psalm 125. 
Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time on and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous might not stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their own crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And our final psalm today is Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, having taken a week off from the daily lectionary discussion that we do, or the midweek discussion anyway, um, we, we finished up the Job uh, in our regular reading, and we've gotten into Esther. And so we have here in Esther, and this is actually even towards the end of the book, so I certainly hope that you've been following along with your own daily lectionary reading so that when midweek comes around, you're a little bit familiar with what's going on. Um, but this, this whole idea of uh, uh, the, the characters, just a brief, uh, brief backdrop on it, uh, there, is, uh, there are Jews that are living during the time of the exile. These are people that um, had, uh, after following a lot of the prophets and all of these things that we've talked about, they were uh, exiled into a foreign land, and they are in the presence of foreign kings, and they are recognized as Jewish people, but they find themselves actually in positions of authority and in power in some places and, and connected with the king. So there's a guy named Mordecai, and he has a niece named Esther, and uh, Esther ends up getting married to the king, but she, in a way, has her Jewish identity hidden, where Mordecai is a pretty outspoken Jew and ends up in conflict with this guy named Haman. So Haman hates the Jews, and there's, a, there's some backstory on it. Haman belonged to a group of people that had been uh, historical enemies of the Jews. And so the animosity that had continued over the years, when Haman finds out that Mordecai is a Jew, he's plotting to have all of the Jews in the land killed. Uh, but Esther becomes aware of the plans, and, uh, and Mordecai talks with Esther about how do we uh, work through this, this concern and these plans. So we get here towards the end of the story, and, uh, and, and Haman has built a huge gallows, and he's planning on hanging Mordecai from the gallows. And he's all excited about it, and he's thinking, at this point, uh, Esther had invited uh, Haman to dinner with the king, and Haman is getting kind of pumped up about himself and thinking, of course, well, the king wants to honor me because the queen is honoring me. It's all about Haman, all about Haman, all the time. And so this massive humiliation right. and total twist of the story comes in where the king wants to honor, because earlier in the story, Mordecai actually saves the king's life from these assassins. And so the king, wanting to honor Mordecai, Haman gives this huge, like, yeah, you should do this, that's the other thing. Like, but all the while, like, who would he want to 
water more than you. Right. Oh, I'm going to sell this. The, the, I'm going to sell this. Like, let's roll out the red carpets. Awesome. <sighs> It's, uh, yeah, and so if, if you're not familiar with the book of Esther, you've got to go back and read it just to catch up on the whole thing. I haven't done it justice in the, in the uh, summary, but just the, the delicious irony that comes upon Haman where Mordecai is the one who is blessed. And, and, and Haman has to be the one to actually announce the blessings. Right. right. And has to be the one to deliver them. Right. You know, the king orders right. him, take the rope, place it on. He has to carry Lead out Lead him around on the horse. Things. You be the herald and, and sing his praises. Um, and then uh, in the next, in the next uh, couple chapters, uh, Haman is actually the one who gets hung on those gallows that he had built uh, intending to hang Mordecai. In fact, Haman himself is the one who gets hung on him. Um, so Esther as a whole is, is a fascinating book um, and certainly worth reading. It's, it's, it's relatively short. You can, you can read it in probably, I don't know, half an hour, I guess, if you took the time to read all the way through it. But one of the things that I'm always intrigued with is how do these biblical texts connect within the daily lectionary? And so uh, I find it interesting that we have the temptation of Jesus in Luke chapter 4, and it's the, the temptations that the devil gives to Jesus. Again, this is prior to his public ministry really beginning. This is after Jesus is baptized and then is driven out into the wilderness, the place where um, the wilderness uh, from Exodus becomes a place where uh, God teaches the Hebrew people about himself, calls them into covenant relationship with himself. So the wilderness is not just a, a barren place, but in the eyes and the imaginations of the Hebrew people is a place where people encounter God right. and experience, uh, experience more of God's character and blessings, even in the midst of the challenges that can exist. So, so for, for Jesus to be driven out in the wilderness is not... Uh, would not be unusual. Right. But what's interesting is rather than just experiencing God's character, who does he encounter in the wilderness? He encounters the devil right. who tempts Jesus. And what's interesting about all of it, it's like, hey, wouldn't that be great if you had all these things? Kind of like Haman was thinking it would be great if he had all these things. Like if Haman were out the wilderness and the devil would tempt him, oh yeah, I want that, I want that, I want that. I am going to... Sign me up. What do I have to do? What do I have to do? I'm going to worship the devil. Basically, that's what Haman would be doing. Yep, because all of those things are exactly what Haman wanted. Uh, we see, again, in Esther, how all of that just gets turned upside down in Haman's life, where he suffers the negative consequences of his disobedience, and Mordecai gets elevated because of his faithfulness. Right. Here, Jesus is being promised everything uh, by the devil and refuses it, based on the word of the Lord. Right. And then we know the ultimate end of the story. Jesus is truly the one who receives all of the blessings. Right. Well, and, and the devil is offering him all of these things. And it's, um, you know, you're going to have this power. You're going to have this authority. You're going to have all of these things. And instead of Jesus taking that on and saying, yes, I want that, he recognizes that he will receive those things through glorifying the Father in obedience to the Father. And so it's not about glorifying himself. It's not about building himself up. It's not about making him that, which in the same thing with Haman, mm -hmm. it was he was so worried about building himself up and look at everything I've done that, of course, that was eventually that was his downfall. downfall. Right, right. Right, and, and Jesus, you know, with these, these false promises that he's offered, recognizes them for what they are mm -hmm. and, you know, recognizes where righteousness and glory and power would truly come from and it's right. not from within and right. so right by resisting those temptations you know is ultimately elevated eventually right right um and so then we, we get this axe connection where um i don't know exactly what to do with it and, and how it connects to the others but um uh I don't know, and, and, and as I sit here and stumble a little bit over the words, you know, uh, I know that we, we read it just recently, but um, 
So, so Paul is going out, Paul is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people, and he recognizes that there are people who have proclaimed faith in Jesus Christ, but are not necessarily living empowered ministry type lives. They, they, they know who Jesus is, they believe uh, in Jesus as, as, the, um, as the Messiah, uh, but they, um, they aren't functioning in a fully prophetic, ministerial type uh, response of faithfulness. And so Paul prays that they would receive uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, there's this interesting concept of John's baptism, which was a baptism for the repentance of sins, uh, where a baptism into faith in Jesus Christ is similar in function, I mean similar in mode, but different in function in the sense of it's, it's uh, acknowledgement of faith in Christ and to be uh, baptism obviously symbolizing death to one's past life and new life, resurrected life in Christ. And so that whole idea of even dying to self, uh, to live unto Christ, and then when they, when they were baptized into Jesus, then they do have the Holy Spirit come upon them. They start to speak in tongues and prophesy. Um, and it's interesting, all together there were about 12 of them, 12 being a uh, reminder of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples of Jesus, those kind of things. It's an important number. Um, and, then, uh, and then Paul goes about and continues to speak boldly, but continues to be uh, opposed by other people in the midst of, of his ministry. So all throughout the history of God's chosen people, you know, link this back to Esther, I guess, um, you know, Mordecai being a Jew, uh, but being in exile, but being in a place of power and authority, but still being in a place where he was threatened. It's, it's, it's just kind of the normal day in, day out life of people who have faith in God. Right. It's not all going to be, you know, rivers of chocolate and butterflies. Right. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be successes. There's going to be temptations. There's going to be temptations. Satan tempted Jesus himself. I mean, you're certainly not going to be exempt from that if he would go to God himself and tempt him. Right. Um, So how does one continue to act faithfully in the midst of the challenges of day-to-day life? Paul is saying, hey, there's greater teaching that needs to happen. And then he goes to other places, there's still resistance that's going to occur, and he doesn't go, oh, no, now there's resistance, you know, I'm going to stop, you know, oh, people don't know everything yet, all of a sudden, he's like, no, no, he's like, okay, let's keep teaching, let's keep preaching, let's Let's just keep going, it's all about Jesus, keep mushing out there. Um, Yeah, so I wonder, like, I guess for our days, you know, I'm, I'm sure that is true for you as it is true for us, some days are, let's just be honest, uh, more difficult than others. Right. And on the flip side, some days are better than others, at least from our perceptions. But that doesn't mean God's not at work in both circumstances. Right. And I think really during our difficult times, during those moments of temptation, when we ask the Holy Spirit to be present, um, withstanding those, moving forward, uh, being obedient, ultimately leads to uh, increased faith in Jesus. Uh, a life truly worth living, um, even with the challenges that confront us, a really good life. Well, and as you look at this passage in Acts, and, and you know, he's talking about, you know, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they're like, no, we don't even know that there's a Spirit. You know, right. and of course, the Spirit is the advocate that Jesus promised mm-hmm. us before, um, you know, the ascension. And so, but you look at the Spirit in that in this situation, and they were baptized, the Spirit came upon them, but they went out and they spoke boldly and they argued persuasively. And so, you know, that's the work of the Spirit. That's the presence of the Spirit. And I think, like you said, when things are difficult or when times are tough, because obviously there was opposition, it was tough, the Spirit gives us that boldness and gives us the word to say and then you flip back to the Luke passage and you know Jesus comes in and he's famished he's been out there and and he is he is physically hungry he is he is all of these things but the spirit was with him in those moments and so that that was 
that gave him that boldness and, and gave him that in that interaction with um, with the devil. And so I think that's, you know, in that everyday life, I think that's when, that's where we get that strength and that. That's the, and, and those places of weakness is where effective ministry takes place. Right. Yeah. So, you know, even the end of that Luke passage that you read, you know, they argued daily in the lecture hall and this continued for two years. Right. And I, you know, and I wonder. <laughs> how like, many times do how, I have to say how this? How many times do I have to say it? Why do I need to keep saying this over and over and over again? It's like, come on, just, it, you know, I think part of my, uh, part of my frustrations, I guess just a little story, part of my frustrations when my kids were much younger and obviously I was much younger too. I was less mature than I am now, right? But I was, I was trying to teach them how to play the piano and I would instruct them and, and I expected them to do that. And I'm like, why are you not getting it? Was I unclear in my message? Did I, you know, did I stutter, you know? But, uh, but uh, and, and rather than being patient, I'd get very frustrated and Morgan actually had to say, yeah, we're, we're gonna find someone else to teach them piano. Um, because I lacked patience. I lacked, uh, you know, uh, uh, full compassion, you know, for my kids. I failed to remember that they were children. They are children. <laughs> they are children. And I had been playing the piano for many, many years and their hands are not going to be able to do the things that they're supposed to do. Um, and so, but Paul in uh, Ephesus and in this, you know, he's day in and day out for two years, at least in this one place. And this is just right. one of the places this, this where he right. was. Um, I think in our age today, we want the Oh, absolutely. Way it there is no way. We I want mean, like, we, the microwave is too too long of a time to wait. I want you can it. get an air fryer; it'll cook it faster an than air a microwave. Fryer. Is that what it is? An air fryer? Yeah, it'll air be fryer. even better. And you can Amazon it next. Everything's next day. If you order before a certain time, you can even get, get it the, the same, same day. day. We don't have to wait for anything. No one's name, so that we do have to wait a little bit. But <laughs> right. uh, I, I don't think anything is same day delivery here. It's uh, it's a little bit old next day. Uh, but everything is instant and immediate gratification. Right. There is no. There is no waiting. We don't wait for commercials. We don't. I mean, we can't even watch TV with commercials anymore, right. because or watch ads or whatever. It's everything should be immediate. And mm. but right. obviously, life transformation is not always immediate. immediate. Right. But in and God's good timing. timing. Right. And yeah, that jumps us back even to Esther, because she became the queen. Of, of the king for a time such as that. Right. Not knowing how it was going to play out, but God using it for his glory in his, his right time. Um, it is fascinating also the Luke temptation story, how the devil quotes scripture right. to try to tempt Jesus. And we read from Psalm 91, which is the song that the devil is misusing right. uh, in his temptation of Jesus but ultimately Jesus becomes the fulfillment of Psalm 91 right. that when we put our faith in him because he was faithful in the midst of the temptation right. then we can have confidence that he will lift us up that then ultimately we will not stumble we will not fall we will be protected um, and it's just a it's, it's, it's a, it's a rich connection, right. you know. The devil knows scripture. We need to know scripture better. Right. And ultimately, we need to be obedient to scripture. Right. And not use it for our own purposes, but use it for God's glory, use it for building up the community of faith. Uh, use it to, you know, remember in the in almost every place that I'm aware of, the scripture is saying, you know, die to self, live for God's glory and for right. the betterment of other people. So scripture is not one of those things that we use to abuse people. We use to love and we use to serve. Right. And that will lead to a better life. Right. All right. Anything else you want to add on any of that? A full life. A full life. 
right yeah and isn't that what we all want I, I think we all want a, a full life um, and I think well I believe that that Jesus is really the only one that has that full life to offer and so let's uh, let's not try to find it any other way let's not try to take the shortcuts that the devil offers but let's uh, let's take that long road of obedience to Christ and, uh, and experience that full life that he promises to us. Want to close us in prayer? I'd be happy to. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us today. And um, I just pray that as we hear your words, that we, um, we feel those in our heart and that we, um, we hear the words and that the spirit is present that there is understanding of the words that you share to us and that we not um, twist those but we use those words that we may grow um, in relation with you and that um, we use those words of scripture to to recognize um, that it is about uh, your glory and um, that we may be made, made whole in, um, in you and in our relationship with you. Um, I pray that um, the Spirit give us boldness that we can um, proclaim and speak for you and witness for you in, in a world that needs, needs to hear um, your message and your word. Um, but give us that boldness that we can go out into the world and, and, and be a light to the world for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. I'm glad we had a chance to do this today. And if you do have any questions or comments or concerns, please do feel free to call the church and we'd be happy to listen to those and, uh, and pray with you. Um, I do look forward to worshiping again on Sunday mornings and I hope that you will be able to join us in person. I do want to apologize for we had some uh, technical difficulties at our last service. You know, the, the more uh, the more technology we get, the greater the capacity for things to mess up. But right. uh, but if you're in person, then you don't have to worry about that. So you're you're here, and even if the mic goes out, you can. I still can talk pretty loud. But anyway, um, I hope you hope you guys have a great day, and I look forward to our next time together. Take care. Bye bye.